Great. Well, today we're in Romans chapter 3. And while you're flipping there, I, I heard that there was a man that was driving to work one day when a truck ran a stop sign and his car was broadsided by another car and it knocked this man cold. A passerby pulled him from the wreck and he revived him. And he began a terrific struggle and he had to be tranquilized by the medics. Later, when he was calm, they asked him, they said, why did you struggle so much? The man said, I remember the impact, and then I remember nothing. Then I woke up on a concrete slab in front of a huge flashing sign that said, Shell. They said, well, what was the problem? He said, somebody was standing in front of the letter S. <laughs> So that's why he struggled. <laughs> There's another one. There's a $20 bill and a $1 bill on a conveyor belt at a downtown Federal Reserve building. As they were laying there side by side, the $1 bill looked over and he said to the $20 bill, Hey man, where have you been? He says, I've, I haven't seen you in a long time. The $20 bill replied, Man, I have been having a ball. He says, I've been traveling to distant countries, going to the finest restaurants. He says, I've been going to the biggest and the best casinos that you've ever seen. I've been to ball games. I've been to numerous boutiques. I've been to the mall uptown, the mall downtown, the mall across town, even at a mall that I just newly built. In fact, just this week, I've been to Europe, a professional NBA game. I've been to Rodeo Drive, all the day retreat spas. I've been to the not top-notch hair salon and the new casino. I've done it all, said the $20 bill. After describing his great travels, the $20 bill asked the $1 bill. He says, what about you? The $20 bill says, well, I've been to a Baptist church. I've been to a Methodist church. I've been to a Presbyterian church. I've been to an Episcopalian church. I've been to the Church of God in Christ. I've been to the Catholic Church. I've been to the Mormon Church. I've been to the Church of the Latter Day Saints. I've been to the AME Church, the Disciple of Christ Church. I've been to the, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, shouted the $20 bill to the $1 bill. What's a church? <laughs> that was bad, wasn't it? That was bad, but whenever I read that, I thought, oh, well. That's... But don't worry, we're not talking about tithing or anything today. <laughs> so anyway, we're in chapter 3, the book of Romans. And today, as we're over there in that great book, let me ask you a question. Some of you, now, the younger folks here won't remember it, but some of those have been around for a while. I know that other people have told me about it. You may have seen the results here of a few years ago by a group of researchers in England. And what they did, they spent 31 years and millions of dollars studying the effects that smoking has on a person. And their conclusion was, after 31 years and millions of dollars, was smoking can kill a person. That was the result. But yet then the tobacco industry came out and they opposed them, and they says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's done by your researchers. Our researchers for the tobacco institution has not come up with the same conclusion as you have. Interesting, isn't it? Smoking can kill a person. We know that. As we're going to see today, the Apostle Paul is going to be talking about how people automatically know, they know way deep down, that they're sinners. Just like cigarette smokers, I knew when I smoked, I knew that it was not good for me. I mean, I'd wake up in the morning, my chest would feel like it was out here. I could not take a deep breath like that. My deep breath was like that. I remember going up the steps or down steps. I remember having a short breath. I remember constantly coughing all the time. And I remember that my vocal cords got so hoarse because I smoked so much that my vocal cords got so hoarse that between that and the polyps that after I would talk for an hour and a half straight, like doing a seminar or a class, I could not talk the next day. My voice was a whisper because of my vocal cords. I knew it was the cigarette smoking the whole time. But yet, I kept putting up smoke screens. 
I kept thinking, oh, that's just hogwash. That's just hogwash. Well, you know, Paul's getting ready today. He's getting ready to confront people. He's saying that you are a sinner. But people, they come up with that smoke screen and they say, you can't be talking about me. I'm not a sinner. Paul's getting ready to confront them. As a matter of fact, today in chapter 3, it's going to be just like Paul is in court in front of a jury in a courtroom, and he's going to present the case. He's standing up. He's a voice piece for God. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through it. As a matter of fact, Paul's getting ready to tell the people, he says, you are a sinner. The Lord tells you you're a sinner. But just like these tobacco companies, we put up smoke screens. We say, wait a minute. I'm not sure that I can be labeled as a sinner. I'm not really so sure that I am a sinner. I'm nowhere near as bad as you are. Isn't that the way we do things today? Paul's going to confront that issue. As a matter of fact, in chapter 1, Paul went to the people and he put away all the smoke screens that these people could have. If we remember, in Romans chapter 1, the people says there is no God. I want to follow my own conscience. Because remember, the people that says that their minds were becoming so depraved that they were falling into all kinds of wickedness. They were becoming, they fell into the homosexual sin, and they got worse and worse and worse. And then in chapter 1 of the book of Romans, Paul says, I finally, I mean, God says, I finally turned them over to their own depravity. Yet they kept denying that they even had a problem. Paul says, all you got to do is look around, and it's inside the scriptures. Just look at creation and at creatures and everything around. You will see that there has to be a God, because the people are wanting to deny that there is a God. Paul says, no, just look around, check everything out, and you'll see it. Then in chapter 2, Paul went through, and he talked to them, because they were saying, you know what? I'm not as bad as that person. You can't be talking to me about it being a sinner, because I'm not bad. I'm not near as bad as that person over there. We had said that the Lord says, compare yourself to me, not to another sinner, but compare yourself to me. Also in chapter 2, we heard him say that the commandments that had given to them, these Ten Commandments that we had talked about in the book of Exodus, what it was to do, it was to condemn the people, to let the people know that they were Sinners, to let people know that they had shortcomings, to let people know that they could not walk a perfect life, that they had to have God inside their lives in order to be counted righteousness. That was the purpose of the law that God had given these Israelites, these Jews and these Hebrews. They were basing everything about themselves because I'm a religious person, I'm a Jew. And we said that today, as we talk about for the couple of chapters in Paul, when we use the term Jew, be thinking of a religious person as well as a Jew, because the Jews thought they were God's chosen, very, very religious. No one was mightier than they. They thought that they were at the top of the ladder. So today, as we talk about Jews, just also keep in mind a religious person. You may say, well, hey, I'm religious also. Well, kind of be thinking about these. They were saying these in uh, chapter 2, they were talking about how they based how good they were because they went to church, because they had been circumcised. We said today people would say, I've been baptized, I'm a church member, I'm on the church roster, I'm an elder, I'm a deacon there at the church, I'm a religious person. Last week Paul says, I don't care what you are, that's not going to save you. That does not mean that that's going to be your ticket into heaven just because you've been circumcised, just because you're a Jew. That does not work. Now that brings us right into chapter 3, where the Jew then is going to say over to Paul, he's going to say, chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then has it, the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? We see right through here the argument of the Jew is against a heart religion. What he's saying there, what value is there of being a Jew? What value is there of being religious? What value is there being circumcised? What value is there of being baptized? What value is there of being inside the church as a church member? What value is it then? But look at verse 2. Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God, the very, very word of God. God gave them the Ten Commandments. God gave them the law. God gave them the scriptures. God had been with them. He had showed them all through their walk since he delivered them out of Egypt how he was faithful, how God delivered all his promises to the people. They never lacked. They never went without. And that's exactly what the Jew says, well, if none of those things matter, then what good is it of being a Jew? 
Paul says in every such way there's a good thing. You've been entrusted with the word. But here's the thing. When you've been entrusted with the word, that means that you're responsible for the word. For those that have been given, you're held accountable for it. Us, we sit here and we hear the word of God. We're responsible for what it says. Now, how are we responsible? We're responsible to do what it says. If we choose not to do it, then that's our own choice. God gives us free will. But the thing is, Paul's saying, you have every advantage because you're a Jew, you're a religious person. God has spoke to you personally. You know his ways. You may be thinking, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, you know, <laughs> what is the advantage of coming maybe to Calvary Chapel? And I thought of one. You don't have to wear a suit. <laughs> you don't have to wear a tie. <laughs> To come to church, as I look around, I don't see nobody with the suit or a tie on. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But that's what these guys were saying. What is the advantage of being a Jew? And Paul says, you have every advantage in the world. Look at verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Would their unbelief be made the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. <laughs> As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and, and may overcome when you are judged. So here the question is that they were presenting, does unbelief void God's promises? Just because I don't believe in what that says, does that mean that God is a liar? The Apostle Paul says right here, no, not at all. He says God's word is going to stand faithful whether you like it or not. Because every man is a liar. And you say, whoa, wait a minute, I'm not a liar. Don't tell me you never said a lie before. Don't tell me you don't exaggerate about some truth here or there. Paul says that every man is a liar. And we'll talk about that more. He says God will prove his word that he's going to overcome those who judge him. Because that was the question. Is God a liar? If I don't believe, does that make God a liar? The Apostle Paul says no. That God is going to come and he's going to judge all those who make a false profession. People say, yes, I know you. Yes, I'm a believer. Yes, I've accepted your son as my Lord and Savior. But then the Lord's going to open up that book of deeds that we talked about and says, well, then let's take a look here. Well, if you say that you're a follower of Jesus and you believe in me and you heard the words and you said that you accepted them, why did you not live by them? And it says that he's going to be held accountable for the word, the word that he heard and received. He's also gone to judge those who accuse him of being unfaithful, like what they're doing right through here. You know, they're going to say, I was a good person. How come I can't go to heaven? I'm going to go to heaven. I'm a very good person. I'm better than that person over there. That's what the religious people, the Jews, were saying last week. The Lord says, we talked about it. You knew that good works was not what's going to get you into heaven. They're going to say, then, Lord, you're not faithful. But it's truth. <laughs> we talked last week that whether we agree with something or not, if God says it, it's true. That when we stand in front of the judgment seat, the great white throne seat of judgment, it's going to be based on the truth. Not what we think is right or wrong, but what does God in his word say is right. That's what God is going to judge us by is his truth. But here's the problem. Some people, they want to use unbelief as an argument, such as these people here. Some people think, well, if I deny it, then I don't believe it. Some people think, I'll ignore it because the Bible doesn't really mean what it says. Other people are going to say, you know what, I refuse to accept it. God wouldn't really do that. God wouldn't send me to hell. I'm a very, very nice person. I go to church, I'm a church member, I was circumcised, baptized, church rod, uh, roster, elder deacon. God wouldn't do that to me. Some people says, I'm going to push it out of my mind so it won't come to pass. Well, if we just tried to ignore it, thinking that the consequences won't come, the Bible says that we're lying to ourselves, we're deceiving ourselves. How many times do we think, especially when we were growing up, we think, well, if I don't get caught, it's okay. <laughs> we all think that. If I don't get caught, then it's okay. Well, that's what these people were saying. If I just push it out of my mind, then it won't really come forth. It won't take place. But Paul's saying that's not the case. You're putting up a smoke screen. 
You're trying to put up a smoke screen, just like we did when, when I tried to quit smoking. I had all these reasons why I wasn't going to quit smoking. So what if it makes me sick? So what if I go to hell? I'll be there with all my buddies. We'll party. See, that's a smoke screen. How many times have we heard that particular smoke screen? I'll be with all my buddies. We use it, but the Apostle Paul says that's not the case, not at all. These people, oftentimes they want to accept the scriptures. They want to say, you know what, I believe this. I believe what it says right through here. I believe what you're saying. I accept the scriptures. I accept that God loves me, that he is a God of love. But you know what, Bill, I have a hard time accepting that part that says that God has a wrath that he will place on people. I have a hard time accepting that. You know, if you take these, a lot of these televangelists that get on TV and they pump you up and they make you feel that you can go out and conquer the world, that's great that they do that. It's good to walk out of church to feeling good. But we also need to be somewhat a little bit convicted because where there's no conviction, there's what? No change. There's no change. If we just automatically come to church every single Sunday and get pumped up with positive thinking, then we don't really say, you know what, maybe this area of my life is a little weak. Maybe in this area of my life I do need to change. And that causes us to change to become more Christ-like. Paul's saying right through here, you believe it. People believe that God is a God of love, but they won't believe that he's a God of wrath. They don't believe that God would send a person to hell. And he's telling them right here in chapter 3, they don't believe that God would send a person to hell to live separate from him forever just because that person doesn't want to live responsible. That person, they want easy salvation. They want to be able to do something, get over with it, then be free to live as they wish. Isn't that true? So true of the church today across America. We just were a temporary, right now kind of people. We want to just get in, get it done, get it over with, and let me be about my business. Paul's saying that's not what salvation is. We talked last week, Paul said salvation is from faith to faith. It's not just a quick temporary thing. It's from the day that you accepted me as your Lord and Savior, I want you to have that same faith all throughout your life right up until the day that you come home to be with me. Not just a quick fix, but you're to live a life of faith. And that's what Paul's explaining to these people right through here. It's not just about starting out, then giving up, and just kind of deny it because you don't want to accept the truth. Paul's saying that very, very clear to them. That doesn't make your sins any less. I remember that when, when I started feeling a little bit convicted about some of the things I was doing, I remember when I was smoking. And people would harp on me all the time. They'd say, you know, Bill, that smoking is really going to kill you. <laughs> Your voice is terrible. You're coughing all the time. You smell with the reap of tobacco on you all the time. And I remember I thought, well, you know what? I'm not going to admit that they're all right. But you know what I'll do? I'll start smoking ultra lights. <laughs> So I went from smoking a regular cigarette to the ultra light. In my own mind, I was doing myself a lot of good. People, when they get to feeling convicted about beer, beer isn't good, beer isn't good, beer isn't good for it. Hey, I know what. I'll drink light beer. You still get a buzz on. You still got the same attitude under a buzz, but you're putting up a smoke screen. They don't want to face the truth. How many people say they quit drinking? And I remember it was a very popular thing. People say, you know what? I quit drinking. I say, good. Good, good, good. Yeah, I quit drinking that hard stuff, so now I'm just a beer drinker. We've all heard people say that, haven't we? Probably even some of us did it. But during the meantime, what are we doing? Are we really admitting that there's a problem? We are, to a some degree. That's why we went from regular cigarettes to ultralights or from beer to, to light beer and from alcohol over to beer. We admit that there's a problem, but we don't want to admit, you know what, it's got a hold of me. It's got me in a stronghold. I need to give it up. We don't want to admit that. We keep putting up all these smoke screens. Paul's saying that stuff has to stop. God is going to judge you. God knows ahead of time what's going to happen. As a matter of fact, God knew all alone that not everyone ex would accept his word here. He knew that. And Paul just maintains here that the unbelief of the Jews, it actually verifies what God said would happen. And he says, you're rebelling. God said it was, you were going to rebel. 
that not everyone would accept it. And that's exactly what's taking place here. But look at verse 5. But if your unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then, how would God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to His glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. The question here is the last question that we just talked about over there. One of the questions was, what values are being a Jew or a religionist? What's the value of it? The second question was, does, does unbelief void God's promise? Does that make God a liar? Here's the third question that they ask. Is God unjust or is God unfair if he punishes the unrighteousness or the sinner? Does that make God unfair? Because a person does not walk with the Lord and God says, you must walk with me and God punishes that person, does that make God unfair? Paul answers the question very clear right there. He says, certainly not. Certainly not. He said, God is moral. God is a, the judge of the world, or else he would not be moral and just. God is going to judge the world whether you want him to or not. It's the truth. He says, I'm going to do it. And that means he's going to do it. If he's not moral and just, and he doesn't judge the world, or, or uh, uh, a judge the world, he's not moral. He's not just. The condemnation of these people that were asking, Paul says, is much deserved <laughs> to ask even such a ridiculous question. That was Paul's attitude right here in this verse. That's ridiculous. How could you ask such a stupid question? That's pretty much what Paul was saying here. <laughs> you know, people just do not want to believe that God cannot take vengeance. People don't want to believe that. They don't want to believe that God is going to hold us accountable for our actions, for things that we say and do. People just don't want to believe that. But a perfect example of God's wrath, look, <laughs> was the cross. Was the cross. Do you think that God wanted to send his son to a cross to pay for a bunch of sinners? Would you be willing to take your only kid and take that kid and allow him to go through or her to go through what Jesus went through for somebody that spit at you, somebody that didn't want nothing to do with you? Good question, isn't it? Would you be willing to let your kid do that? Then you tell me that God's vengeance isn't real. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive by the Spirit. God allowed his only son to go to that cross, that horrible death for you and I. So God will take vengeance. God has to judge because he is a holy God. The scripture is very clear. It says that God cannot even be in the presence of sin. When you read the book of Isaiah, it says that when we're in sin and we talk to God, God more or less turns his face until we confess it. Then the Lord then would be with us. God says, no way would the guilty go unpunished. Now this really, Paul's getting down to a doom and gloom case here, isn't it? <laughs> Paul's letting people know exactly where they were at in that particular day. This is the hardest thing to do about teaching verse by verse through the book, is you have to preach the parts and teach the parts that Paul says or God has for us to hear, even though it may not be a build-up message. But at the end of this chapter, it's encouraging. But we have to go through that part because somebody is not going to recognize that they're, they need a Savior unless we recognize that, we need, that we're a sinner. <laughs> That's the thing about verse by verse. I, you don't get to preach what you want to preach. You preach what the Scripture has to say. Doing verse by verse. Look at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. 
The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Wow. Paul's making it, uh, or God's case right here is that all men are sinners. That's what he's saying. All men are under sin. That's what my translation says. Does yours say that? What it means, when it says under sin, it means to be the subject under the power or of the power of. That's what under means. Under sin means to be the subject to the power or under the authority of whatever it is. Paul's saying here, hey, you religious person, you Jew, (laughs) you're under sin just as much as any other person is. You're no different. Just because you come to church, Just because you're an elder, just because you've been baptized, just because you're a preacher, just because you're a deacon, just because you're who you are, your flesh, you are a sinner. People look at people and they look at people inside the church and they see them do wrong and they automatically want to give up on God because they look at people in the flesh. The Lord says don't do that. Don't put your eyes on man he'll let you down. Put your eyes on me and I'll never let you down. That's what Paul's trying to make the point to the men right through here. But the religious person, the Jew here, they want to say, are we not better if we have the Bible? Are we not better since we profess God? Are we not better people because we know God's will? We study the Word. These religious people, they really seem to have it together. But then Paul says the scriptures just declare that being religious doesn't make a man acceptable to God. You can have the word all that you want to know it. You can know the word front and backwards. But we talked about it in the book of Exodus and also in Romans. You can know everything that there is to know. But if you don't do it, what good does it know to know all that? Paul's making it very, very clear right through him. He's letting them know God's case is all men are sinners. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not within us. So whatever smoke screens that these people have put up by now, Romans 1, 2, and 3, they blow them away. They let people know. Whether (laughs) they don't believe in uh, God, they want to believe in creation, Paul put that down. The people that says, I just want to follow my conscience, I just want to feel good. Paul blows that away. He says, don't rely on your conscience. (laughs) You know, rely on the truth. Because your conscience may not condemn you of the truth. So you don't want to rely your life just on how you feel. Because how many of us one day feel good, the next day we feel bad. Paul's saying, you don't want to base your salvation the day that you're feeling good. I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm going to heaven. And know that in your heart. But then the next day you're having a bad day and you think, oh God, I'm going to hell. Look at me, I'm going to hell. No, you don't want to base on your feelings. Paul says we want to base everything on God's truth, not on our conscience or on our feelings. Paul then speaks to the the Hebrews here by the commandments. (laughs) God has uh, spoken clearly to every generation throughout all history, leaving everyone without an excuse. We talked about that the first week in the book of Romans. We says, what about the little pygmies in the backwoods of Africa? What are they going to do if they never heard the word? Well, number one, we support missionaries to get them to go out there and do it. But number two, it says that man knows within his own heart. Remember back in uh, Romans chapter 1? I'm not sure the exact verse, but somewhere around uh, 15 or 16, somewhere in that area, where we had talked about that man knows, God put it within a man's own heart to be able to look around and know and see creation and know that there has to be a creator. But the problem was the man didn't want to recognize that there is a creator because if he recognizes there is a creator, that means he has to submit to that creator. No, he says, I want to believe what I want to believe. I'll have my own little God because I don't want to be submissive. We all have to submit to somebody. 
We all do. I don't care who you are. You're going to have to be, have a submissive attitude. It's very, very clear here in the Scripture. And the reason why, because Paul says you're all sinners. I'm a sinner. Paul says in another verse, I'm the chief of sinners. <laughs> now, when we look at Paul, we think, wow, there's a holy man. There's a godly man. Read about David. <laughs> David lets us know just exactly how much of a sinner he was. Paul saying right through here, God has spoken to everyone. No man is without an excuse. Not a single person is righteousness. That is, nobody is perfect and sinless. Not by your nature. You were not born. You were born a sinner. You get out, and the first thing you do is you do what? You cry. The first thing you do is your parents slap you on the behind. <laughs> you know, then, then you turn around, and the first time your parents say, do this, what's the first thing you say? No! You take something out of their hand, what's the first thing they say? Mine! <laughs> the Bible says that we're born in a sinful nature at birth. We're born in a sin. The Bible tells us that. No man has ever lived a perfect life. Nobody has. Think about your words. Think about your thoughts. Think about your actions. Think about everything that you do throughout the course of the day. Let's say, as an example, you're a good person. Let's say that you sin 10 times a day between your words, your thoughts, your actions, your deeds. Now you say, well, I don't sin that many times a day. Between words, things we say, is everything you say to somebody edifying to build them up? I know mine's not. Is everything that you think about in your mind, is it all holy? Is it righteous on the thoughts of God? No. What about your actions on the way that we handle situations? I know I'm weak in that area. Now, let's say that you're a holy person. You sin 10 times a day. But since you belong to Calvary Chapel, Waynesville, let's say you only sin uh, seven times a day. But since you're here today, this particular Sunday, let's say you only sin three times a day. Three times a day since you're Calvary Chapelites. Well, over a period of a year, how many sins is that? At three sins a day. That's a thousand. What does the average person live to be today? Seventy? How many sins has that person made in their lifetime? Seventy thousand? And that's just at three sins a day? Yet we think we're holy people? <laughs> Imagine now you're getting a ticket and you go up here in front of the guy, the judge, up here at the courthouse, and he says, okay there, lay down your case. Well, here you go. I got seventy thousand trans against me. What do you think that judge would say? Aim! <laughs> Get that bum out of here! Now, if a judge says that, and he's human like you and I, and he says hang him, how much more will a moral and just God judge us? Point clear? Very clear. Kind of hits it right on the head. You and I come short. No one is righteous, as it says right there in the Scripture. Not even one of us is righteous. He says the case of the tongue there. He says your throats are like open graves. If you've ever been to an open grave, it's foul. <laughs> doesn't have a good smell. Things good don't come out of it. It's a symbol of corruption. He says your mouth it tells deceitful lies. It cheats. It misleads. Your mouth is poisonous. It tells lies. It gossips. It seeks to hurt people. It seeks to destroy people. It also causes cursing and bitterness. Paul saying that any of these that a person is involved in, God considers sin. He says God desires you not to be filled with sin, but to be filled with love, joy, peace, and the spirits. That's what God desires that you be. He says men are quick to jump. They're swift to kill. The men have to have their own way to get what they want. People ignore, people ne uh, neglect God. But then this is the part that he gets to. The fear of God is not in their eyes. They don't see the fear of God. That's the problem, is we want to go on and continue living the lives that we want to live, but we don't fear God. What does the Bible say? Fear the Lord. And what else does it say? Fear is the first step to wisdom. <laughs> Fear the Lord is the first step to wisdom. The Bible is very, very clear about that. Now, 
there in verse 19 and 20. <laughs> After speaking about our bad condition, our bad situation that we're in, Paul's now bringing light into the picture. <laughs> this part that we've been so condemned about and how Paul has hit us between the eyes with what terrible people we really are. Paul now has the good news. I'm going to read that again. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul's saying, there's something great that's getting ready to take place here. It's called justification. Justification is getting ready to take place. Look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and, and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's one of the most popular scriptures that there is in the Bible. Because when people, especially for evangelists, when people try to share with somebody that they have shortcomings, that they need a Savior, people say, well, I'm not a sinner. I've never sinned. This is the verse that they go to. It says, for all have sinned. That means me, you, Billy Graham, the Pope, we're all sinners. No one is perfect. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul saying right through here justification. He's getting ready to introduce it. Justification was a legal term that they used. It speaks of more than forgiveness or more than pardon. Justi justification means to be declared righteous. To be declared righteous as though it never happened. As though it had never happened. Justified. Just if I had never sinned, justified, just as if I. That's a good way to remember it. Just if I'd never done it. That's justification. That ought to be an amen right there. That's good news. After all that bad news that we've been hearing here for the last 30 minutes, now Paul's coming into the good news. <laughs> you see, the Lord doesn't say, I've been bearing with you. I've been putting up with all your sin. But I'm such a good God that I'm just going to overlook those things that you've been doing. No, that's not what the Lord says at all. No, he says that once I have faith in Jesus Christ, God looks at me as being justified as though I have never sinned. It's good news. That ought to bring on more good news in that last 30 minutes of the sad news about us. <laughs> that when you and I have faith in Christ, it's just as if we had never sinned. Righteousness, now Paul's revealing it. And he says that righteousness is going to come through faith. It's for everyone. It is needed by everyone. It's for everyone and it's needed. <laughs> if your Bible says needed, you need to underline needed. <laughs> it's not something that we want, but it's something that you got to have. You might be saying, you know what, I'm doing pretty well. I'm not near as bad as my neighbor. Well, you know what, you're comparing yourself to the wrong person. They probably are just as bad as you are. <laughs> I told you a story about one time when I just got saved. I took an evangelism class. We went to a house. I'm sharing my faith with this guy, and he's sitting there drinking a beer, kind of a little bit of a negative attitude, and I'm sharing with him, and I'm all on fire, and I really don't know exactly what I'm doing yet. And I'm telling the guy, I said, yeah, man, I remember when I used to drink. I said, you know, I'd get off work every day, and I'd stop by the bar and get drunk and this and that, and I could drink a case of beer every couple of days and put away a couple of bottles of Jack Daniels or Jim Beam. That was my lifestyle. The guy looked right at me, and he says, Boy, you were bad. You really did need to get saved. I'm not near as bad as you were. <laughs> 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 
He's saying right through here, don't compare yourself to somebody else. If you want to compare yourself, compare yourself to me. I'm the light. Use the proper measuring stick when we want to measure who we are, right? He says, for all have sinned. All have sinned. <laughs> then, when we do that, when we compare ourselves to the Lord, we will continuously see that we are falling short. We are falling short. We need righteousness, and this righteousness that we need only come by justification. Justification is a free gift of God. <laughs> There's no way for you or I to earn it. Justification is God's grace and grace alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved, through faith. Not that of yourselves, but it is a gift of God so that no one could boast. Because if you and I could save ourselves, who would we give the credit to? Ourselves. So he says it's for by grace. Well, what is grace? <laughs> it's a God's free gift. It's unearned, undeserved, unfavored, unmerited. It's a free gift. You can't work for it. It's just like if I take my pocket watch right now and I give it to Amanda here. And if Amanda, I say, here, Amanda, here's my pocket watch. It's a free gift. I want to give it to you. And Amanda reaches in her pocket, pulls out a purse, and says, here, I at least want to give you a dollar. If I accept that one dollar from her for that $150 pocket watch, if I accept that one dollar from her, is it any longer a free gift? No, she puts something towards the purchase price. Same way with salvation. God says it's by grace that you are saved, through your faith, not by any good works. It's by grace. So he's saying that this justification is only through redemption. Now, remember redemption. We talked about that in the book of Exodus. Redemption means to redeem, to deliver back, to buy by paying a price for it, to buy back. That price was through Jesus Christ. He paid the price. He redeemed you and I unto the Lord. Verse 26 hits that very, very clear. We see that justification now, it saw this dilemma. God in one hand looks at you and I. The Bible says that he's a God of love. But then on the other hand, the Bible says that you and I are sinners. So here we're, <laughs> we're weighing it out. How do we go here? I got my good over here. Today I'm up here, tomorrow I'm down there. But God over here is a just God. God loves me. He doesn't want to put his wrath on me. So what does God do? God solved the problem through his son, Jesus Christ. Very, very interesting how he did this. <laughs> because in 1 John 4, 8, it says, John, de uh, John declares that God is love. But also in John 4, uh, uh, 1 John 1, 5, tells us that God is also light. Now listen to where I'm going with this. <laughs> Therefore also that God loves you and I so deeply, but he also sees our rebellion clearly because he sees light. He is light. And if he said, I love them so much that I'm going to overlook their sins, would he any longer be light? No. You take and make this room pitch black and, shine and open up that window, the light does what? It exposes darkness. Does that mean... And our lives, that if God doesn't really want to acknowledge our sin, that there's not sin? No. We have sin in our lives. God is light. The eyes of the world were drawn to England when two 10-year-old boys were arrested for the death of a 2-year-old. Now, if following their trial, the judge said, I know these boys beat that little toddler to death, but I'm going to let them go because I really love these boys. The world would then be justifiably outraged and incensed, wouldn't they? After two 10-year-old boys just beat a toddler to death, could that judge let those two boys go? <laughs> kind of God's dilemma. He's love, but he's also light. The solution? The only solution is justification through that redeeming work that Jesus Christ had done. There was a 17-year-old that was arrested. Now, here's justification. There was a 17-year-old boy that was arrested for driving recklessly. As he was brought into court, the young boy was relieved to see that his father was the presiding judge. An hour later, the judge rendered his decision. 
Your reckless driving, he said, your, your driving has endangered the people of our community. Consequently, justice must be served. You will either pay $1,000 or you will serve one year in jail. Dad, the boy said, you know that I don't have a penny to my name. Young man said his father, in this court, you will address me as your honor. Hmm. Powerful, isn't it? I am your judge. And down went the gavel as the boy stood shot before the bench. The, paint, uh, the uh, plaintiff approached and was ready to take the boy off to jail. When the judge stood up, he took off his robe, he left the bench, and he went down to stand by his son. He said, behind the bench, I'm your judge, but here beside you, I stand as your father. With that, he took out a checkbook from his pocket, and he wrote a check for $1,000 to pay the son's fine. That's exactly what the Lord did for us. He left heaven to come to earth as Jesus to write the check of redemption. To pay the price of propitiation. Isn't that fabulous? It ought to be perfect. What a wonderful illustration that is. Isn't it? It's beyond comprehension that God would have come up with a plan that was so perfect that it confirmed both His light, but yet at the same time, His love without compromise in either one. He's seen sin of you and I, and He's a holy God, but yet He didn't compromise. He solved the problem, and He solved that problem through Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. This young man in the illustration, following his dad's offer to write a check, pay out the $1,000, if this boy would have jumped up and he would have said, Get out of here, Dad. Why did you have to pronounce such a harsh judgment on me even in the first place? I'd rather take my chances in jail than to accept charity from you, Dad. I don't think anyone would feel sorry for him, would they? I don't, I don't think anyone in the courtroom would have shed a tear on his behalf with that type of an attitude. So, that's the way God is, that he's going to say, no tears will be shed for those who say, I couldn't care less about a God. I could care less about a Jesus Christ. I could care less that he came down and to pay the price for my sins. I could care less. How many people do we know that have that attitude? I meet people every day that way. I could care less. I could care less. I've got a busy schedule. I've got places to go. People see. I've got things to do. I've got a busy life to have for me. I don't have time for all this nonsense. Don't bother me with it. And what such a shame for these people to even think that way because the price was paid on their behalf on the cross. It was offered in a way that would have cleansed them fully, but they deny it. Where would that boy have gotten that day in court in that particular situation if he had said that to his dad? He'd have been in jail, he'd have been condemned, he would still be doing his time. Nobody would have felt bad for him. But as it was, that's not the way that he took care of it. Romans, over in 327, it says, Where, there, where is boasting then? It is excluded, excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith. Now, this is a verse you ought to highlight or underline or do something. Verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who would justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. <laughs> Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now what he's saying right through here in heaven, no one's going to say, hey, look what we accomplished. Look at what we did. Hey, look what we did at our Bible study on Tuesday nights. Look at what we did in the men's groups. Look at what we did on the prayer meetings. Look at what we did with our youth group. Look at what we did with their feeding homeless. Look at everything that we did. But it says right through there, there's going to be no boasting. <laughs> there's going to be no boasting of what we did here on earth. 
It's going to be through faith, <laughs> not by boasting what we've done. You know, we have to recognize that all of our attention needs to be on Jesus Christ. He's the Savior, and we are the Savies. He's the Savior, and we're the Savies. You say, well, well, why am I doing all this work then if it's not going to be based anything on my work? It's because you do it out of gratitude. You do it because there's an example of a change that has taken place within. It's an outward expression for something that he did inside of us. We do good works because of saying thank you for what you did to me. James says faith without works is dead faith. You really need to check and see. If I don't have any desire to do any kind of good works, then maybe I need to do a checkup on my faith to see if I really believe what the Scripture says I need to do. There's only two gripes, or, or two gripes, two groups of religious people. One group is those who emphasize behaving. <laughs> you must do this. You must do that. You got to be circumcised. You got to be baptized if you want to belong to this church. You got to fill out this roster over here. You got to give so much out of your paycheck. You know, there's church groups that go through and they look at your tithes and your offerings. And if you're not given to 10% what they're doing, that they will actually confront you over it. There's churches that do that. There's groups out here that says you have to do this, you have to do that. Basically, all that is is that, that, that you have to behave, you have to do all that. It's man reaching up to God. He's trying to reach up to God. That's one of the church groups. But the other church groups is a person that emphasizes, or a church that emphasizes, believing, believing, faith. For all I trust Him, faith. One group is behaving based on works, reaching up to God. The other group is based on faith faith. You know what that is? <laughs> That's God reaching down to man. That's God reaching down to us. I recognize that you've accepted my son Jesus and I will accept that. You'll never be able to be good enough to work your way into heaven. Never. James tells us in the book of James that we need to emphasize on believing since the way that we believe will affect the way that we behave. We need to emphasize, let me say that again, we need to emphasize on believing since the way we believe will affect the way that we behave. Very good point that he's bringing across. Why does Paul say faith in Jesus Christ established the law? Very, very quick, go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. And Paul explains right through here that Jesus Christ establishes the law. Because, look at this, verse 24, Galatians 3, 24. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Powerful, isn't it? The law was our tutor. Does anybody have a different translation? Was put in charge. So here we see the purpose of the law, according to this Galatians, was to bring you and I unto Christ, to let us know that we are sinners, we can't live up to the law. So once we realize that we cannot live up to that law, that is to bring us over and recognize that we have to have somebody mightier than us. That's the good news, that we're not based on how good we can handle something. Therefore, belief in Christ accomplishes the very purpose for which the law was given. Isn't that powerful? It's powerful. You know, as I was studying this, I looked at that Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 23 through 25, and it used that word propitiation. It's a pretty big word, isn't it? A man in Texas had an urge for a midnight snack. So he rolled out of bed. He walked down the hallway towards the kitchen. Passing the nursery, he noticed that his three-month-old son's bassinet toppled over on the floor. Racing back into the bedroom, he woke his wife to see if she had taken the baby from the bassinet, but his wife was sound asleep and knew nothing of the matter. Panic filled his heart, and he ran down the hall, down the stairs, and into the living room, where much to his horror... 
and shock, he saw his 12-foot python with a large lump in his center. He knew immediately what had happened. In anger and outrage, he went to the back porch, he grabbed the splitting maul, and he chopped the snake up, and then he ran out the front door screaming. He was later committed to a mental institution. This is based on a true story. It's not something I'm just making up. When you hear about this story, it'll haunt you. But it will also, you say, well, why are you telling such a horrible story like that? It's because, stop and think about it. It's, it's, it's helpful to help us understand a biblical concept that we're studying here in the book of Romans. This biblical concept is often misunderstood by people who wrestle with theology, with what the Bible has to say about certain things. You see, as long as you and I talk about the love of God all day long, everybody will sit here and listen. But when you talk about the wrath of God, people don't want to hear it. This is usually not one of the most popular messages that's preached in church. As a matter of fact, in my home church, this is usually one of the least sellable CDs <laughs> or tapes that most people don't want to hear it. Because, as I said earlier, the thing about teaching in a Calvary Chapel way is you have to teach what the Scripture says and not skip over some of the parts that make us feel bad. But you have to teach verse by verse. So here you see, yet... Think about this. The wrath and the judgment of God are things in which people struggle with the most. Yet if the man in Texas was justified in smashing the snake, how many people think that that man was justified? <laughs> That's right. Everybody's shaking their head yes. He was justified in smashing the snake. How much more is God justified in dealing with snake-like people? People who go along and destroy other people. Think about that. Think about what happened in Somalia. Tens of thousands of babies starved. Why? Why? Because the warlords were fighting for territory. They were fighting for position politically. During the meantime, they were preventing food from reaching the kids who were starving to death every day. You may remember seeing that on TV. What about over in Bosnia? What happened there? Where women were raped by the soldiers and thousands, tens of thousands of men were slaughtered, all in the name of ethnic cleansing to get rid of certain people out of that race. What about in the schools? There are schools all around the country where they will not rent part of their school out to a religious organization. They won't let you pass out any types of scripture. But that same school will pass out condoms. But they won't let you pass out scripture verses. Is that right? <laughs> Why does God allow this type of insanity? Why does he not see not only the tragedy of Somalia and Bosnia or the depravity of, of some of these other people that we're talking about, why does God put up with the world that's so bent on destruction? The answer is very simple. <laughs> because he created you and I in his image. What does that mean? <laughs> he gave us the ability to choose. When we read about these horrific stories about a baby, I heard that news yesterday in the morning where they got that baby and that baby had like, 17 broken bones in his body when they brought it to the hospital. Did you all hear that on the news? Yeah, they brought a baby in, and it had 17. The people inside the hospital said that was the worst thing that they had ever been brought in that hospital. It was an infant baby where the parents abused the baby and broke all the bones. Why would God allow something like that to even take place? Yesterday, Amanda and her friend, they went to the abortion clinic over there in Asheville. Why would God allow the people to go into the abortion clinics? Why does he allow all this? Because he created you and I in his image with the ability to choose what we decide to do. Hmm. When you and I started listening to that little fsh, 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 that hissing of Satan, when we started listening to him, just like back in the Garden of Eden, who spoke to Eve? The serpent. She started listening to the hissing after God had already given her the commandment not to do that. But she decided to listen to Satan instead. That right there was the beginning when we turned our choices over, when we turned our planet over to Satan. That's why there's diseases, rapes, war, death, sadness on this planet. It's not a matter of God allowing these things. It's a matter of man allowing Satan the authority to do it. When you and I sit there and all we allow is Satan to come into our mind and cause us to do things, we're giving Satan the authority. 
God says, I'm still God, but I'm just giving you the freedom to choose what you do. Meanwhile, God looks down from heaven, just as he did in Noah's days, filled with the, uh, the righteousness, anger. But here's the good news. Just like in Noah's days, Noah found grace, didn't he? Noah found grace in the Lord. So didn't Noah's sons. They all found grace through the Lord. Two, he's going to pour out his wrath again. When's he going to do that? In the day of tribulation. But until then, what's the solution for the wrath that God feels concerning the way that these people are acting like that snake? They're just going around destroying people. What is the solution? The answer is propitiation, that word that I keep going back to every now and then. Pro, uh, propitiation, why a big word? Because it's really not a smaller word <laughs> that has that kind of effect on it when you study it. Because I know as I started studying that word propitiation and started doing all the word lookups on it, the first time I ever... Uh, studied that word, what it means is to appease, to reconcile, to conciliate. Which means that you see the distinction between your sin, but yet you're a sinner. You say, I'm a victim, but I also commit to sin myself. Sin hurts people, it destroys people that I'm around. It's cruel, it's like the venom of that snake that we talked about. My own sin is no less devastating than the person that's next to me. So there, God, understandably, filled with a righteousness anger, which can only be satisfied through propitiation. Now, how does that take place? And I'll finish it up right here. God says, the wrath that I should vent on you was instead on my son. Who reconciles us to his to him, Jesus. Who conciliates us unto him? Who's our propitiation? <laughs> you see the point? That word, even though it's so big, it has such a powerful, powerful meaning to it. As we said earlier, that we need to understand that that word propitiation ought to give you a warm heart. That God would love you so much that he would actually become the object of his own wrath. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Was God. Then down 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God come to earth in the form of a human. That human was Jesus Christ. That's why I say, God loves us so much that He was willing to take His own wrath just for you and I. What good news that ought to be. <laughs> you know, We need to say, Thank you, Lord, is what we need to be saying. When you and I leave here today, we ought to be thanking the Lord for that propitiation. We ought to be thinking that not only, thank you, Lord, that I'm a sinner. <laughs> thank you for that 30 minutes of hammering on me that, that Pastor Bill did. <laughs> but thank you for that last 20, 30 minutes that he did also with the good news. Because as I was studying this, I kept thinking, how many minutes of bad news? I'm getting tired of sharing this bad news with everybody. How long is it before I'm going to get into the good news? And the Lord said, you just finished telling them what they need to hear, and then I'll finish it off with good news. The time was almost equal. Didn't seem that way, though, did it? Seemed like we spent a lot more time hearing about how bad we were instead of hearing about the good news about what the Lord did for us. When you think about that propitiation of Jesus Christ, when you leave here today, you ought to have a warm heart and a blown mind <laughs> that he would actually do that for you and I. And you, we ought to be saying, Lord, I ask you, Lord, not to let me settle for a life that's shadowed in sin. Because we just got through saying what sin did to a person. But please allow me to live a life that's light. Light in the world. A light that you reflect on me. A little boy attended a church and that had a beautiful stained glass windows. He was told that the windows contained pictures of St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John, St. Paul, and other saints. One day, the little boy asked, what is a saint? He replied, a saint is a person that the light shines through. Isn't that a good example? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we studied your word. We thank you, Lord, that for this time that you help each one of us realize that no matter what we do, that we're declared a sinner. But, Father, that's not the good news. The good news is that you sent your Son to take my place, my wrath. 
And Father, you said that when I accept your Son, Jesus Christ, to be my Lord and Savior, that you no longer look at me as the person who is just a religious person, but you look at me as one of your children. And we thank you, Father, for that wonderful gift. Now, Lord, we just pray, Father, that with this good news that we have, knowing, Father, that we're born again, we're regenerated, that we have a new life in you, that we're no longer the people that we used to be, but we have a new life through your Son, Jesus. Now, Father, just teach each one of us how to live day-to-day life, how to have a constant awareness of you that's in our lives, how to know, Father, that you love us, how to know, Father, what your will is in each one of our lives, guide our steps, guide our words, guide our actions, guide our mouths, guide everything that we do in life, Father. And we just thank you, Lord, that you chose each one of us, that it was nothing that we could do on our own behalf. All we did was accept that free gift, that free gift, grace, God's riches, at Christ's expense. What is God's riches? God's riches is to know that we can have a life of victory, to know that we're going to go to heaven, to know that we can pray to you, Lord, at any moment, and to know that you hear us. That is your riches at Christ's expense to know that as Jesus walked up that road, he carried that cross, and he had that crown of thorns on his head. They beat him along the whole way. That He did that for each one of us. We thank you, Father, that we accept that free gift of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, just continue to work in each one of our hearts, each one of our lives. Give us the faith to believe, just as James says, Lord, that when we concentrate on what we believe, that would change the way that we behave. So it's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we're gathered here today. Amen.